Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. When Kevin and Andrea were growing up, um, I, I went to the doctor's office one day and they had uh, an advertisement for a series of Bible story books and filled out the card, sent them a check, and uh, got this huge set of books. And uh, we read the Bible story to our kids every night before they went to sleep. I mean, they wouldn't go to sleep unless we read them the Bible story. And uh, one night, it was about David and Goliath. And uh, uh, we read them a story, and it finished up in that story like this right here. Then David cut off Goliath's head and claimed victory for the Lord. So I said, good night, sweetheart. Y'all sleep good. Daddy is headed off to bed. Everybody likes stories, don't they? Everybody likes stories. Um, Kathy and I just went to see Star Wars and I've uh, been watching it since it first came out as a trilogy and of course it's expanded and done all that stuff. Uh, by the way, do, do you know uh, why the uh, Jedi crossed the road? He, he wanted to get to the dark side. But <clears throat> anyway, the, the Star Wars movies have netted about $65 billion worldwide. Now I'm convinced that it's not about the special effects. I, I'm convinced it wasn't about that. I, I'm convinced it told a story. Uh, and everybody likes a story. It was a story uh, like the, really, the meta messages of life itself about good and evil. It was about redemption and forgiveness, and uh, they're all there. You know, story is a big part of our lives. Now, my goal this morning um, <clears throat> is to talk to you about those stories. Um, wh why am I going to do that? Because that's the way Jesus told the message. L look in your Bible to Matthew 13, if you will. I'm just going to read uh, one verse this morning in uh, Matthew 13, and I want you to see that one verse is verse 13. Um, and these are the words of Jesus. He says, therefore speak I to them in parables. Now that's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And Jesus imparted those stories in a powerful way because he says, they seeing not and hearing they hear not Neither do they understand. Seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, and they don't have any understanding. So in order for me to get them to understand and to see and to hear, uh, he chose the methods, he said, of telling stories. Powerful way to do that. Now, there are two things that I want you to walk out of here with today. All right? Here they are. First of all, to recognize that you have a powerful story. Now you may not realize the influence of your story, but you have a story to share and you are a lot more inspiring with that story and here's the reason why. It's your story. Now the second thing I want you to walk out of here with is that I want you to walk out of here with an understanding that someone is dying to hear your story. Somebody that is in need of hope, somebody that is in need of encouragement, somebody that is in need of knowing that they're not alone in their situation, that someone else who faced the same thing that they are facing found hope, found encouragement, their life was changed by the power of God and that brings them hope that their life can be changed too. So, Here's the two things, realizing that you have a story and second, somebody needs to hear it. That's what I want you to walk out here with. Now, you may not think that your life and your story is inspiring simply because you have to live with it uh, every day. But here's something that no one in this room can deny is that God uses people to change people. God uses people to impact people. And so the question is this morning to everybody in the room, 
what person can God use you to impact? What person can God use you for them to have a God encounter? Now, here's the reasons that a lot of people don't share their story. First of all, uh, they have a selfish approach to it. In other words, you know, it's my story. This is what God did for me, and uh, it's mine. And then they have this tremendous fear about them. They're just totally scared to communicate that story uh, with anybody else. Or they may be, and the third reason they don't share is because they're oblivious to the fact that God can use their story to change somebody else's life. My hope before we leave today is that the Holy Spirit of God can show you that you have a story and that he will inspire you and challenge you to share that story with somebody that's in need. Now, Jesus realized the power of a story. And he used parables, according to his own words, to be able to communicate that in order to bridge people with God, just ordinary people. He communicated to farmers. He communicated to fishermen. He communicated to tax collectors. And he connected them with God's story. And that story always had a beginning, it had a middle, and it had an end to it. One of the things that uh, came out to me in, in the men's conference over the weekend as we were watching, got caught off guard, a little bit surprised by one of the speakers was a creationist. And, and I sat there in amazement and realized that God's got this humongous story that he's telling. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. And one of the things that occurs to me uh, this morning when I look at all of us is that every one of us in this room are part of God's story. You're an amazing part of God's story. You know, when I was growing up as a kid, uh, I wanted to be a part of a story that was much bigger than I was. I, I lived in a very remote part of the mountains of Western North Carolina, and I only had a few cousins around me, but uh, me and my cousin, Ronnie, uh, would get out into the yard and somehow we'd been able to muster up a couple of ball gloves and a baseball and, and I wanted my life, I wanted my story, I wanted my reality to be something much bigger than what it was. And so I pretended that I, I was Lou Burdett or Warren Spahn of the uh, Milwaukee Braves. And I'd get out on the mound that we had made and, 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 and I'd just pretend that it was the bottom of the ninth and there was the bases were loaded and there were two outs and it was a three-two count and I would throw that three-two count and strike out the guy and the Milwaukee Braves would be the winners of the World Series. I wanted my story to be bigger and I, I dare say that every one of us in this room face that from time to time and we can recognize the power of a story. Now the second thing after recognizing the power of the story, now here we go, is that uh, we can articulate that story. You say, that's a mighty big word for an old boy up in the mountains. And well, I thought it was a pretty big word myself. In order for me to understand, I had to go look it up to see what it meant. And it really means to define. It means to craft. It means to think it through. It means to write it out. Now, my educated guess is is that over 90% of you in this room today have never sat down and you've never written out your story. You've never seen it in print. You've never thought it through. You've never defined it. You've never uh, taken the time just to write that story out where you could read it. So my challenge is to you this week, I want every one of you to leave today and at some time between now and next Sunday, I want you to take the time and I really, the sooner you do it, the better and the more likely you will do it, is sit down and just write out your story and you simply put down, you know, this was my life before Jesus Christ. This is how I encountered Jesus Christ. That's the middle part. And this is my life now that I have received Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. 
and just spend the time writing it out. Here's the second thing. After you write it out, I really want you to memorialize it. I, w- I want you to just to digest it. I want you to soak it into your life. And then I want you to practice it. Now, m- many of you just came out of an 8 o'clock life group. Several of you are going to leave in a few minutes and you're going to go to an 11 o'clock life group. And f- now for the next several weeks, uh, how, how many life group leaders are in the, in the building? Let me see your hand just a minute. Hold up your hand just a minute. Good night, good our life group leaders. The next several weeks, I, I want you to give your class an opportunity for somebody in that class to share their story. Now, that's a powerful thing. And here's, here's the reason it's powerful. It's going to enable you to be in the very safest place that you could ever be to share your story. It's going to give you the ability to practice it. And the amazing thing about it, you're going to find out some things about yourself and you're going to find out some things about the other people in your class that you never dreamed possible. You you just never thought that. You never uh, understood that or realized that. You, You know, there's so many people around us that are in need of hope and they're going to find that hope through your story. You're going to find out that you're not alone in that story. They're not alone in that story. And they want to know that they can experience life change when they hear that God did that through you. Um, I know that in all probability there's several in here that you don't have a life story. Matter of fact, you, you just kind of wound up here today. Somebody invited you or you just nudged in your heart, uh, but, but you're here today and, and, and you, you don't have a story of divine encounter with God. Somehow, some way, you're still on your journey. You're still making your way. You're like a guy I witnessed to not long ago and I asked him about trusting Christ as he saved. He said, I'm not there yet, but I, I, I'm on my way there. And, and maybe you're on your way there. Well, you're in the You're in the greatest place in the world. You're in the safest place that you could possibly be this morning because you're surrounded by people that have experienced a major life change that's going to bring you hope and bring you encouragement. You know, the Bible is filled with life-changing stories. Um, When I uh, encounter a non-Christian and don't know a whole lot about the Bible. And I challenge them to read the Gospel of John. I just think it's a great place to start because it's filled with people who have life changed. For instance, in uh, the fourth chapter, uh, here, here's a, a, a Jesus encounter and he's making his way up to Samaria and he gets to a well and he encounters a woman there at that well. The disciples go into town and, and they're picking up some stuff and uh, Jesus is with this woman and they're in this encounter together. And then in verse, in the early middle verses there, he says to her, uh, go call your husband. She says, I don't have one. He said, well, that's a truth. You've had five. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. She had a Jesus encounter And he gloriously changed. And then verse 28 of John chapter 4, the Bible says that she runs into the town and she says, hey guys, y'all need to come see a man that I just encountered that changed my life. Isn't he the Christ? She had a God encounter. Um, He he had another encounter with an old boy in in the scriptures in chapter 5. Uh, he had been lame for about 38 years and he looks at that old boy and he says, hey, do you, do you, you want to get better? <laughs> you want to be well? Yeah, you want to be healed? And the old boy said, absolutely. Jesus said, well, take up your bed and walk. And the Bible says immediately, instantly, he had a God encounter, changed his life forever and ever. But then in one of my favorite chapters is chapter 8. And, and, and the religious leaders brought in this old gal into the presence of Jesus and said, Jesus, we, we just caught her in the very act of adultery. 
the law says we're to stone her. What do you think about it? He never said a word. He just knelt down in the dirt and doodled in the sand for a few minutes. And he raised up. And uh, he said, any of you guys around here that don't have any sin in your life, then you feel free to throw the first rock. Well, that was a rock concert that never did come off. <laughs> he, he doodled in the sand for a little while longer, and then he raised up again, and everybody was gone, and he said, where'd everybody go? He said, is, is there nobody here to condemn you? And, and the woman said, no man, Lord. And he said, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. A major God encounter of forgiveness. But, but then he had a healing encounter with this old man been, been born blind. And I love the way Jesus always uniquely approached people. He, he never did it the same way twice. And this is one of those times you just want to laugh, you know. So boy's blind as he could be. And what Jesus do? He spit in the dirt and he made a mud pie. And, and he took that mud and he put it on the old boy's eyes and told him to go wash down in the water. And immediately the guy received his sight. Powerful encounter. And I just, you know, when I read these stories like that, I, uh, I can't help but think the disciples of Jesus, what were they doing when they saw all of that stuff? I wonder what came out their mouth. You see, all of these encounters really teach us the nature and the character of who God is. So let me ask you the question now, the logical question. What's your encounter with God? How did God save you? How did God change your life? Where were you? When God forgave you of your sins and changed you, and you, by the way, salvation is a cataclysmic, convulsive event that will never leave you the same. Where were you? You ought to remember where you were. And you've never been the same since then. What's it like? What's your life like now since Jesus has saved you and changed uh, your life? You understand I want you to write that down and memorialize that event in your life. And once you've thought it through and celebrated it, now you've got something to share. <laughs> you say, you know, I've, I've heard all these testimonies and, and when I compare mine to some of those testimonies that I've heard before, uh, mine really turns out to be rather boring, Pastor. I, I, I never was on drugs and, and, and I, I don't have a, Elvis Presley tattoo running up the back of my neck and I just don't have all of that stuff that I was like, I want you to hear this. If you don't hear anything else, you need to hear this. Your testimony does not have to be intense to have an impact. Your testimony does not have to be intense to have an impact. You don't have to have a painful past to recognize that you are totally empty apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to murder somebody to have a heart that's full of darkness. You, you don't have to live as an atheist. I didn't have to live as an atheist to be filled with all kinds of fears and doubts. Uh, I, I didn't have to spend time in jail to know what it was like to be imprisoned and in bondage to my own sin. Y'all all know my story. I've, I've told it many times before uh, how I grew up trying to gain the approval of my family and having to gain the approval of the people that I went to school with and, and everybody around me in the athletic department. I had to just keep proving and proving and proving and, and, and that carried over into my approach to God. I felt like I had to, I, I had to be something and do something before he would ever accept me and and, and I married the only real Christian that I'd ever known in my life. And my number one ambition in my life is I want to please her. 
Three weeks after we were married, we moved to Colleen, Texas. And, and when I got to Colleen, about three weeks after we got settled in that little trailer beside the railroad track, she looked at me and she said, I want to go to church. I said, absolutely, let's go. Hear my heart a minute, you ready? God took the very thing that was important to me to get to me. He used the very thing that was important to me to get to me. Sitting there on the pew and God knew what I had to hear and he said, I love you just like you are. You don't have to go change. You don't have to go fix anything. You don't have to go undo anything. I love you just like you are. And friends, my life's never been the same since. And I've had the opportunity, and I believe with all of my heart, that God somehow has used that story to impact many people down the road. Why? Because it's my story. Recognize the power of the story. Articulate the story. And then here's the third one. Listen for opportunities to share your story. Here it is. There he goes. I wondered when it was going to get to this point. He always going to talk about, always has talked about witnessing, always talked about evangelism. Here we go. Just witnessing stuff. Some of you get burdened down with guilt and shame because of your past and because of the fears that grip your heart. And you finally come to the conclusion, I just don't think I can do that. I don't think I can be effective at that. Now the key here is this. The key is the word listen for the opportunities. So we're not asking you to shove your way into somebody's conversation. We're not asking you to kick down a door to make an opportunity. Not asking you to do that at all. We're not asking you to jerk somebody into an alleyway and tell them they're going to die and go to hell if they don't get saved. That's what happened to me as a six-year-old boy. Um, not asking you to do that not asking you to do weird stuff. Hey man, do you know you're going to die and go to hell if you don't get saved? No. I'm not asking you to be walking your dog one day and somebody says, hey, that's a nice dog. Dog, that's backwards for God. He can be your best friend too. No. That's not it. You know what, you know what the world is full of, it's full of people who are looking for somebody that's genuine and that somebody has the time just to listen and care about what they're going through. So just listen for those opportunities that God gives you. Colossians 4 says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. What, What's my job as a child of God? My job as a follower of Christ is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God and genuinely care about other people and then look for an opportunity that God gives me to plant the seed of faith in somebody else's life. I may not see the results. It took me a long time to get there as as a Christian. It took me a long time to get there as a pastor to realize it's not my job to bear results, that's God's job. And, and, and Corinthians tells us, Paul says, you know, my job is to plant the seed of faith. Apollos comes along and waters, but it's God who gives the increase. I remember after the resurrection, one of my favorite stories in the New Testament, Peter and John were going into the temple. There's no boy lying there. And he was begging for alms. He was crippled. And he was begging to, for his sustenance. And Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none, but such as we have in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And that old boy had new ankles and new 
feet and new bones and he leaped and he praised God running into the temple and the temple crowd who had just seen him lying there at the entrance way, they said, wait a minute, what's happened to him? Peter and John had the opportunity to tell them what Jesus had done. said, we didn't do this, it wasn't us. Jesus of Nazareth, he's the one that did this. Next day they were put in jail by the religious leaders and they let them out of jail and they said, hey guys, what, what were you thinking out there? What were you talking about in that setting? So here's the third opportunity. Peter and John said, well, it's just about Jesus. Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. He rose from the dead. So here was the opportunity to speak into one person's life and then God gave them the opportunity to speak into the crowd's life and then the next day they had the opportunity to speak to the religious leaders and if you study the passage, 5,000 came to faith in Christ. Powerful use of opportunities. They didn't force their way into any of them. God gave it to them. Let me ask you a question this morning. What makes you afraid to share your story? Um, because one of the things that I want to do before we say amen here today is I want you to identify what the fear is that keeps you from telling somebody else what Jesus has done for you. And then not only do I want you to, to, to identify it, I want you to define it. I want you to get it out there. Is it intimidation? Could be. It could be embarrassment. You're maybe afraid that somebody is going to judge you in some capacity. Or maybe you're just afraid of ignorance uh, if somebody were to ask you a question that you would not be able to answer. And so the fear of embarrassment uh, comes and grips your heart. These are all the same excuses and fears that I've heard since I became a Christian in 1970. P Peter and John, they were commanded by the religious rulers of their day, said, you can't talk about this anymore. It's creating chaos. So we are commanding you now to shut up about Jesus. You know what their answer was? We can't help. We can't help but tell what we have seen and what we have heard. We can't help it. You, you understand that fear of intimidation, that fear of judgment, they overcame it and they didn't let it stop them from spreading the gospel. Um, you, un you understand something? They got to the point that they said, you know, we really don't care what people think about us. We have an audience of one, and he's the one that changed my, my life, and we can't help but tell other people about it. So the real issue here is, you know, who, who is it? Is it about people or is it about God with you? Now, the second fear is ignorance. You're afraid that somebody's going to ask you a question that you won't be able to answer. Can I help you with that? It's okay when somebody asks you some theological question that you're not familiar with to be able to say right back to them, you know, I don't know the answer to that. But I tell you what I'll do, I'll research it, I'll look it up, I'll try to find out what the answer is and I'll get back with you. But this is what I do know. I know that once I was blind and now I see. I once was lost and now I am found. Let me tell you what I do know. It's okay to say I don't know. Fears will stifle your story, but there are people in pain that need to know that they're not alone. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about this for a minute, okay? What one person that you know may be healed because of your story? I want you to think. What one person who's never had a God encounter might be healed because of your story? One person that's not going to heaven that might go to heaven as a result of you sharing your story. 
I, I want to bust a myth here. I'm going to bust this myth. The myth that you have to have it all together to be a witness. In that early church over in Acts chapter 4, when God was using Simon, Peter, and the disciples unbelievably. And, and society got to looking at them. The, the, the world's religious crowd got to analyzing them and, and, and trying to figure out what in the world is going on here. And the Bible says in Acts 4.13 that they saw that these were just ordinary men that had been with Jesus. <laughs> Big difference. We've been talking about salt and light, haven't we? And that's what God wants us to be. So here's my challenge to you. You ready? I want you to write out your story. I want you to think about it. I want you to practice writing out that story. Practice sharing that story. Getting your small groups, get your family together. But practice sharing that story. And then I want you to listen to some opportunities that God's going to give you to speak into somebody's life. This morning when you came in, you were given a card that looks something like this right here. Okay? Uh, it's got a little attachment, got a perforated thing to it. And, and if you'll notice, <clears throat> there's a big question there, who's your one? By the way, if you didn't get one when you came in, there'll be plenty of them right outside in the guest table. All right? I want you to take a minute. I want you to think about who that one person is that God has just kind of laid on your heart to start praying for right now. Yeah, my guy is a guy named Jimmy. Haven't seen Jimmy in about four or five years. Jimmy knows me. He's a businessman in this area. Unchurched, never had a God encounter. Wife got saved here at one of our special events. But Jimmy doesn't know the Lord. He's at the top of my list right now. He's my one. He's the one that I'm seeking for an opportunity for to listen, show him that I care, and share my story with. I got a couple of more. I got Richard and I got Jackie. I got three, but at the top of my list is Jimmy. He's blinded. The Bible says that the God of this world has blinded his mind that he cannot see. So what I've been doing is I've been praying for Jimmy. God, I want you to open his eyes. I want, you, I, I want him to see his need for you. And then God, give me that opportunity to share my story with Jimmy. I want everybody in the room that has had a God encounter. Your life has been changed by the Spirit of God. I, I want you to write down the name of the person that came to mind when we ask you to Identify who's your one, okay? I want you to write their name down on that card. Just tear it off the card, write their name down, put it in a prominent place, hold on to it, and pray over that person in these next few weeks. All right? Share your story. Church-wide, here's, here's the deal. Uh, we, we've been praying for a long time, seeking the Lord for weeks and weeks about where we're headed in 2020. Here's what we want to see the Lord do in the next 11 months. In 2020, we want to see 700 people experience life change. We want to see 700 people have a God encounter. 700 people who meet Jesus encounter him. And be gloriously saved by the grace of God. Now you say, Pastor, you don't need to be concerned about numbers. Well, God's concerned about numbers. He named a book. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. He identifies 5,000 got saved, 4,000 got saved, 3,000 got saved. Multitudes got saved. God cares about numbers. You, you know, the, the only people that I know that are putting numbers down are those that are not running them up. Just... I thought that's pretty good myself. <laughs> we want to see 700 people 
come to Jesus. We want to see 400 people follow the Lord in believer's baptism. We're going to begin like this. Write your story down. Memorialize it. Get familiar with it. Begin sharing it in safe places. Listen for God to give you an opportunity to share your story. March the 1st, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring your one to church with you. March the 1st, I want you to bring your one to church with you. I'm, I'm going to preach a gospel message that day on how a person can be saved and know Jesus. Okay, bring your, bring your one. On March the 8th, Johnny Hunt's going to come. It's going to be a huge thing over the weekend. We're going to be celebrating who's your one with some other churches in the community. But uh, I've asked Johnny just to come. Since he's going to be here Saturday and Monday anyway, I've asked him just to come and preach Sunday morning here. March the 15th, we're going to have a tremendous celebration of baptism. We don't see people baptized. We want to head toward that goal of 700 salvations, 400 baptisms. And March the 15th, we're going to see evidence of that. I don't even know if I'll get to preach. I believe there'll be so many. I'm praying there'll be so many. I won't have time to preach that day. We'll just be having a baptismal service all 930. Glory to God. All right? I pray that you'll love him enough that you'll share him with somebody that you know. Now, some of you here this morning, you don't have a story. I wish Julie was in here this morning. Julie was at eight o'clock. She's been a member of this church for a number of years, a long time. I'd probably say 25 years she's been a member of this church. Sits right over there all the time. This morning she came weeping and she said, I had to get this right. God told me to trust and obey. And she said, Pastor, I believe that this was my last opportunity that God was giving me to have a salvation experience. I said, wow. I said, Julie, are you serious? She said, I, I'm serious, Pastor. I need to be saved. Prayed to receive Christ. I said, Julie, what did God do for you this morning? He saved me. There's some of you that have never had a God encounter before. You don't have a story, so you, you're not going to be able to go home and write it out because God's never changed your life. Well, he can this morning. And before you get in your car to go home, you can have a story to share. Would you bow with me? Let's pray together. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you don't have a story, if you can't go back to a time and a place where God changed your life. By the way, salvation is a life-changing experience. You'll never be the same. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.